you still need to be able to be okay with losing all your money at whatever stage in your life you're at. We'll import this product and you know, these things will sell like wildfire. So and yeah. That's exactly how it went. That's exactly how it went. That's exactly how it went. <laughs> whatever version of success our business has achieved, it will still probably fail. Entrepreneurism is an incredibly selfish endeavor. You need to be absolutely convinced that you never could have done anything else. I got my first call from an investor saying, obviously not gonna be investing right now. Everything's going completely crazy. What we learned from that experience was fundamental to the business that we now run. The biggest mistake we made, very obviously, was Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very excited to have you. Um, I think that one of the most important things that I kind of want to have with this conversation is just an honest con conversation about entrepreneurship, being able to just touch on like actually what it's like in the trenches at the time. We've talked about this before, but I think that a lot of the press and media and everything out there on entrepreneurship is very, it's after the fact, it's success story. Um, and you're very much a success story, but I also think like you're, very, you're in the trenches and you're honest about it. And that is what entrepreneurship is like. So um, I'm particularly excited to talk about that. To introduce the audience to yourself, will you give us so like three bullet points on your on your career. So what it's been from the beginning to where you are now. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It is wonderful to be here. Um, I'm really excited too. And, and yeah, and as you said, um, perhaps what I can bring that some of the other incredibly inspiring, successful people that you've had on the show um, can't is a yeah is a kind of live as you say from the a trenches live, beat. live live from the trenches <laughs> update. Um, but I suppose while the kind of maving side of the story is is definitely you know where it's at at the moment and, and interesting and, and ultimately why I'm here, what kind of got me there or, or what led to the starting of that is definitely um, yeah is is was was kind of foundational in the kind of you know becoming the person that could then well start a business to some extent. Um, so I I grew up in South Africa. I suppose I initially had a um, a very false perception of what working hard meant and then I thought that, you know, the less work you did and, you know, as long as you could still achieve something, the cooler you were. Yeah. That got completely stamped on when I then got to the UK and, you know, was then in the educational system for university that, uh, you know, was way higher than what I'd kind of grown up in um, and discovered that I wasn't naturally intelligent at all and then I would have to work really, really hard just to survive. Um, I then went through, so I, I knew I wanted to start a business from very early on. Um, and I, I then met, met my business partner at university, which we'll maybe talk about in a bit. Um, but I, I knew that I needed to go off and get a formal commercial training. So some people start businesses straight out of university. I have absolutely no idea how, um, I know you did. It's very impressive. Uh, some people start businesses on their own. I also have absolutely no idea how I also know you did. Um, but wasn't that wasn't going to be the case for me. So the way I looked at it was that I was going to go and do um, some time in, you know, so I'm the more numerate of me and my business partner. Uh, he's the more sort of sales and marketing side of things. So it made sense for me to go and do some time in finance. And, the, what, and did you know that you two would start a business together? Was that kind of the idea from the off even before you'd decided on the business? Yes, very much so. So we met in second year of university in a philosophy tutorial talking about ethics and within about six months had become best friends and decided that we were going to start a business together. Um, we both we both had individually known that we'd always wanted to start businesses mm. um, and it was through, we both discovered then in second year, we were both passionate about climate change. So we knew we needed to start a business and we also knew that if you we're gonna, I think maybe said me this more than me and he kind of taught me this, that if you were gonna dedicate your life to, you know, your work really, you were gonna, there was gonna be an opportunity cost to that, right? Mm -hmm. You were gonna give up on lots of other things and that you needed therefore to be able to look back on that, that business um, and go, you know, it had a positive impact on the mm -hmm. world because I had to give up so much for it. And so, yeah, we knew that it needed to be, you know, have a positive impact on the world. And I think because of the, you know, we, we were both very, felt very strongly that the the major issue of our time is climate change. So we knew it needed to be, needed to be green, um, and we knew that it needed to be together. Um, so I then went off and did five years in finance, um, 
uh, first starting at a you know a job I didn't really want, but that gave me great qualifications to move into um, mergers and acquisitions, which is a division of investment banking. Um, and the original goal had then been to go into private equity and do a bit of time in that to learn. For, for those of you who don't know what private equity is, they're the um, sort of funds that fund uh, private businesses rather than businesses on the stock market that then enable them to grow. So it's a very operational side of finance. So mm-hmm. they often have people on the board of the, of the business. And so they're very, um, they're very involved in the day-to-day running the business. So I thought, here's a way of kind of a semi-risk-free way of getting entrepreneurial experience mm-hmm. without actually starting my own business so that I can then pick up the skills with which to start my own business. It's very well thought out. So that was the theory, <laughs> right? That was the theory. It really makes sense when you think of it like that, because there is no... I mean, you can do an entrepreneurship based business school course, but actually yeah. you're going to learn much more by actually doing it. But how do you do it in a way that's risk free going into the back end of essentially either something consultancy based, but PE or yeah. like VC or any of those exactly. types of things? Exactly. It's, a, it's a very, I think some people could maybe, could maybe actually just like formalize this type of training. Look, I wouldn't, I, 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 I suppose I'd recommend in some ways, although I, I would, you know, to, to, that it, it's not it's it, it didn't actually end up being yeah, that, I suppose. Right. So I learned some some toolkits mm-hmm. from that process that have been completely fundamental in what in what we do now. And particularly for me, I mean our business is very capital intensive. So you need to be able to model cash flow really, really well. And mm-hmm. actually there aren't that many businesses, there aren't that many trainings that give you the ability to do that in mm-hmm. the way that, that that corporate finance does. Um but in terms of actual like what it's like to hire people, what it's like to, um, you know, to structure an organization, what it's like to grow, what it's like to manage crises. You know, it, it doesn't teach you. It doesn't. Yeah. Teach you that well, also anymore. because in so so we have at Tala, we have private equity, um, a, a private equity investor, and I know you do as well. And obviously, same one. The active. No. Was, oh well, I mean, same DC investor. Oh, okay. I was, I was like, I was like, oh yeah, okay, no, no, okay, no, no, okay. No. Um, So yeah, of course, it's like the there's a huge amount of help and input and really useful conversation that goes into the business. But in terms of like the day to day trenches stuff, mm. it's it's still you within the business. So Completely. there's probably I can imagine there would be quite a gap with that. Yeah, yeah, could be, and particularly the early stuff, right? You know, the the early stages of Maving are. You know, they are, you, you spend most of your time like driving stuff around in vans. You know, mm-hmm. it's completely unrelated to high level strategic acquisitions. You know, why should company X buy a company in, in, a, in you know, a completely different company, a completely different country? It's so far removed from the, mm. the really hustle of like actual starting a business from the ground up with yeah. no money. Um, so it may be, maybe the experience or maybe the kind of like, actual uh yeah the, the actual kind of experience will come into play a bit later if the business gets a bit later but but uh but yeah it was a good idea in theory and i think i still would recommend it but um it it ended up being i suppose i didn't don't think i stayed for too long but if i'd stayed any longer it would have been a lot more ego based and mm-hmm. i think that was something that i really learned by the end of the, my time there was that i was it's it's very different to separate being in finance from the kind of ego side of being in finance. And that is really damaging. Like it's really, really damaging because as much as the intention for going into that industry was right and was, as you've just described it, seemingly quite a well thought out plan, the actual process by which you do it and the Mm -hmm. steps, the the hoops you have to jump through to do it are incredibly competitive, incredibly like macho and intense and, uh, you know, have a lot of really toxic work, working styles and yeah. office working cultures related to them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I, th- I think I, 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 th- I think a, a lot about, you've got to think very carefully about why you're actually doing it and whether or not you do it for too long. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you say that when you were in finance, you kind of suffered a full blown burnout. How, how did you get to that point? Cool. Uh, yeah, I'll give, I'll give you a bit of the story. <laughs> cool, I, I can of, give you this one. No, I can, I can. I, I can give you a bit of the story because I think I've talked about it in quite sort of high level terms mm. so far. So yeah, so all right, I, I'm at university and no need to go, off, go into finance um, to go and supposedly learn these skills. Um, get into this, uh, get into, a, go start at the big four, but had a rubbish CV, hadn't done any work experience or, mm. or work, uh, work experience or internships because who knew you needed them? Um, and so end up at the firm. I didn't really want, well, firm I wanted to be at, but a, department I really didn't want to. 
to go, okay, how am I going to get out of, how am I going to get out of this department? How am I going to, you know, move into something more interesting? How am I going to move towards PE? And so I decided to do uh, this new, the company I was at launched this new program called the intensive program, which kind of said it all, which was rather than doing an ACA over three years, you did over a year, one year. And so that's an accountancy. Compressed. Yeah, charged, it's a standard charged, UK charged accountancy qualification. Uh, and so I start doing that and I, you know, so I, I get there, I, I arrive at this new firm and I've just come back from three months with Seb driving motorcycles around Indonesia surfing. You know, I've got blonde hair, I'm all tanned. <laughs> <laughs> and almost immediately get fired. I mean, I the, the first exam was two weeks in. I failed the first one. The reset was two days later and I passed by like 2%. So it was very nearly completely out the door. You know, it, it would have all been over before it started. And then had to, you know, work, do this three-year course condensed into one year. But then what, as I was doing this, I was realizing that I was really, that I wasn't going to be able to get out of this department by just doing mm. that. And so I decided to do this other qualification called the CFA, which is a, a more financy, less accounting qualification that is, it's really, it's very hard. It's got a 20% pass rate and the fastest you can do it is in a year and a half and decided to do that on the side. So while I was working this full-time job, which was like, you know, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. was then also doing, studying for the exams in the morning prior to that and exams in the evening after that. And it did work, but it, it you know, I did, so I, I did get through and I did pass and I did survive. But it very nearly, uh, it very nearly, you know, sent me off a cliff. Um, but it kind of through that process, that was definitely where I learned, you know, where I learned to properly work. That was definitely a kind of the, the period where I learned that if you really want something and you really put your mind to it, you can achieve it. But I also learned kind of where, well, I probably didn't learn where the boundary was at that point, where, the, where I learned the boundary came next. So I used that, that qualification. Now the CV was no longer so rubbish. Um, to get into this job I, I, I wanted. So I moved to an investment bank, to the m and team, an investment bank that was a company I, I had very much wanted to work for. And because they had seen this, uh, because they, they saw that I'd done these two qualifications at the same time, and that I was very young when I did that, you know, these places fetishize yeah. hard work. They absolutely yeah. did. So they'd seen that I'd done that. I went, oh, he's perfect. He'll slip right, he'll, he'll fit right in. And so I, I totally over-interviewed and got to a level within that place that I was nowhere near cut out for, like nowhere near qualified for, because I'd spent my whole time at, at the big four place um, doing these exams, not really doing the actual work. You can kind of get away without doing the work there. So I hadn't learned any practical skills. I then get to this investment bank where you really are required to mm. perform. You know, they, it's a very under-resourced operation. That's why people work these hours. And you have to really, really perform. And I really like was not there. So I, I, I get there. And I kind of think, oh, this is, you know, I'm finally in the big leagues. This is going to be really cool. And I'm once again, totally out of my depth, completely underwater. Um, there, you know, they will fight you. The big four, they, you know, it's very yeah. it's difficult to get fired unless you fail your exams. This place, if you're not performing for, you know, a couple of months, you're out, like you, you're just gone. And that stress was unreal. The, the stress of having come in too high, knowing you're not good enough and yeah. being told you're not good enough and working you know, frankly, like in humanitarian hours, like really, 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 really wrong hours, um, all combined to, yeah, to, to really, to, to push me over the edge is, is maybe too strong a term, but it definitely, there were the, that first six months was something that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish on anyone for mm. sure. Um, but it also taught me a lot, which was relevant later about what, what a workplace shouldn't really be like, because I didn't really have any support. You know, the whole thing there was kind of, well, you've got yourself here. You're, you're supposed to, you're supposed to be really smart and capable, like figure it out kind of thing. And that actually, with a little bit more support and a little bit more, you know, guidance, it might not have been quite so impossible. It might mm. not have been quite so um, unpleasant. Um, but but yeah, it wasn't. But I did. I suppose look, six months later, I did kind of, I did kind of crack it. I, I, I got myself up to where I was expected to be. I was, you know, by no means brilliant at it. Mm. Um, but it was kind of around. Yeah, it was, it, you know, it's, so then I'm, I'm there for a bit longer, but then it kind of gets to the end of 2017 and, uh, you know, Seb and I have both been in, you know, our respective careers. He'd gone and done the equivalent of my finance side of things in sales and marketing, but we're both feeling like we've got as much as we're going to get out yeah. of our, you know, conventional careers that we've, we've looked our formal commercial trainings are now complete. We also felt a, 
definitely a kind of impending sense of climate doom. Um, you know, this was end of 2017, Paris Climate Accord was the year before, you know, it was really starting to, you know, the world was really starting to wake up to, you know, the severity of climate change and the speed of it. And we felt that if we were going to be a part of the solution in any way, you know, we'd need to get on it right, like immediately, mm -hmm. or we wouldn't, you know, or, or the problem would have run, run away with itself. So obviously you decided to leave finance and kind of the very traditional achievements that you had from that with all the, you know, the labels, the accreditations and all of that. Am I right in thinking that you left when you still didn't have a business idea, you just knew you wanted to start a business? Yeah, very much so. So I think one of the things about the, you know, the hours we were doing was that we would, it was very clear that we weren't going to be able to think of a, a business idea while doing mm -hmm. that. And I think the people who do successfully start businesses while working another job, they often work in the industry that they see Absolutely. a niche in. And I think you almost need to do it that way. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in some ways envious of people who can do that. But for us, it was like, and I think, you know, I've got to give him credit. Like this was, this Seb was, was itching to go. Like I could have definitely, I could have let the ego, you know, keep me in finance for another year or so. But Seb was kind of going, look, we've always wanted to do this together. Like I'm ready to go, like it's now or never. And I was, yeah, I was, I was happy to, to take that plunge with him. Um, and so we, yeah, we both left and we didn't actually have to look for very long. So the, I suppose we looked at the, we looked at the climate crisis. We went, okay, so the number one contributor to um, carbon emissions in many countries, including the UK and the US is transport. Mm -hmm. Transportation is one of the few Christ, one of the few areas within this crisis that is really easy to solve. Mm -hmm. You electrify all the vehicles and then you decarbonize the grid. I mean, it's, it really is that simple. This technology already is available. It's the unit economics work. Um, so this is something that we probably can do something in. The really challenging areas like, well, I mean, air, air travel, is, I suppose, fits into transportation, but like cement, those are going to take decades of research, right? Yeah. But so we felt we could, we could have an impact within electrification. Um, and so we were kind of looking at that in general, but really what it was, really how we found this idea um, was we, Seb's best friend from school, who'd been living in China for the previous seven years, got in touch to say he'd also just quit his job and had invested in and was kind of co-founding this electric motorcycle company out in China. So Seb was already a kind of passionate motorcyclist. Um, he, uh, yeah, he, he, for him, this was a kind of dream come true. I wasn't. Um, but as I said, was kind of interested in electric vehicles. And so we kind of did, we got very, very excited, you know, cool, cool, cool. And then told ourselves, all right, calm down, do some due diligence, you know, understand what, what, what is this really? And what we found was that, okay, in, in Europe, electric two wheelers had just started to really take off. It had gone from kind of a thousand units a year to 5,000 over the course of like 80 a year. Uh, in the UK, there was still basically like non-existent industry. Yeah. There were less than 300 electric motorcycles or scooters sold in 2017. But China, 20 million being sold a year, 80% electric vehicle adoption. So you've got one of the highest electric vehicle adoption rates in the world. Um, and, and, you know, it was, it was, you didn't need to do that much research to, to see why it was because they were using these removable battery electric scooters and motorcycles. So we went, okay, brilliant. Like this is going to be great. We'll import this product that, that Seb's mate is making. Uh, we'll import it into the UK. Um, and you know, these things will sell like wildfires. This is, this is going to be cool. Um, so and yeah, that's exactly how it went. That's exactly how it went. That's exactly how it went. Um, so yeah, so I, to answer your question directly, we did leave without an idea. We knew we, we had, we had a direction. Um, we also, you know, I, I, I had some savings, but we, we kind of had to come up with a bunch yeah. of little side hustles to make everything work, but we were able to we were able to dive into that project fairly quickly. I think it's really interesting as well because we hear a lot about side hustle culture and how I yeah. I would always say if you can stay in a job mm -hmm. while starting your business or while kind of generating your minimum viable product, like just working out something mm -hmm. to really find out more about the industry, find out more about your product than do just because I'm the type of person that I, I'm happy with risk in some ways, but I'm very risk averse when it comes to like, this could ruin everything, yeah. if that makes sense. So it's kind of a safety blanket yeah. um, that you're able to develop. Whereas actually, if you, as you say, if you look at certain industries, there is actually no way that you can simultaneously do those things. So you almost give yourself, I mean, you take away your safety net completely and make yourself dive into it. 
it, it, exactly. I think I think you're right to say there are two ways to do it. Um, because certain industries you definitely can't. Um, you definitely can't do. You definitely can't start a business or develop a minimum viable product while working a crazily demanding in terms of hours job. Um, but what I would say is that what was really interesting to me was quite how quickly you adjust to a different standard of living. Yeah. So what I would say to anyone thinking about this, and there's a million reasons why I'm going to tell you not to be an entrepreneur, but what I would say is that don't think that you won't be able to make ends meet. And I, that coming from a position of, you know, of privilege and of and being single as well, not yeah. married with dependents. Um, it was, I was surprised how quickly I moved from a you know, pretty well-paying job to basically, you know, no income and still was able to live in London. And so I would say that the, yeah, you're able, you, you were just down mm. quicker than you'd expect. And was that from your savings? So I was eating into savings, but like the nice thing was me and Seb were like the agreement with everything was 50, 50. Yeah. So we, we, you know, we, we lived in a flat together, tiny little flat in Elephant Castle. Um, we, you know, we obviously own half the business each. Um, we would do the same, you know, little bits and pieces here and there to make money. And I actually kept my savings aside until the business really got right. going. And, 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 you know, I did, I did end up using them, but the, so my experience was one of someone who wasn't eating into their savings. Yeah. If you see what I mean? Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, I did, I did have some, but the, my, yeah, what I, what I'm saying stands is that you can, you can make enough money from sort of hourly stuff mm. to survive in London and still live a fairly comfortable life. Um, in a way that you wouldn't expect you could. And what type of things were you doing to make that money? Oh, we did all sorts of stuff. Um, there's some funny stories that we might have time for. We, we, we did some film production stuff for a, a good friend of mine who has a film production company, you know, producing music videos and, and uh, short films and stuff, uh, which wasn't very good on that hourly rate. Uh, we did a lot of tutoring. We looked at like, converting vans you know this was when the van stuff started we, you'd buy a Volkswagen transporter kit it out sell it we DJ'd we you know threw <laughs> parties I mean there was all sorts of like little not very lucrative things to mm. do um the thing that was that was really that we we after you know after a long time of doing this and there was two years before more than two years actually before we had, we had any money um was that was really going out of rate was tutoring you know yeah. it was a really really because you could do two hours in the morning or two hours in the evening and you could just fit that around your work yeah. because you know kids want to kids want to do that outside of school yeah and do you think that because you took away that safety blanket you were actually more determined and was putting more time into the idea and giving yourself more motivation to, to kind of start a hundred percent a hundred percent i mean you know, you've, you've chosen to give up something, right? Like you, you haven't chosen to give this up to be a part-time tutor, part-time DJ. Yeah. Like this is not, you know, no, no offense <laughs> to any DJ. I certainly wasn't going to be a DJ. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not successful one anyway. Um, so, so yeah, you, you are, you are committed, but, but you, you know, th 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 this is, this is the ultimate thing about starting business is that you have to know that you want it more than anything else in the world. You need to know actually more than that you want it. You need to know that there's there's nothing else you ever could have done. There's no way you could have not tried it. It's kind of yeah. like being a professional athlete or being a um, or a musician or an actor. You kind of know, I will never forgive myself if I don't yeah. throw everything into this at least once. Mm. Really interesting that that was kind of, you You had that calling as well. Um, I, I personally, I don't think I've ever had like a calling to entrepreneurship. I think it's really? more been like one foot in front of the other. Okay, this makes sense. Let's do this. But it's, but I'm, I think that, I mean, I think that I think that obviously both are completely possible, but it's exactly it clearly gave you such an enthusiasm and a motivation to actually be like, let's find something, let's make it work, and if it doesn't work, yeah. let's try and let's let's make it work again. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think that is that you, yeah, that, that is true. I suppose the the calling thing. It's more. It's you know, unfortunately that's quite a, the way you just framed. It, it's quite a positive spin on it. It's more that like. I knew that if I didn't do it, I would be miserable forever. Mm. And it yeah. was like, I can't, even though I think this, that actually I didn't think it wouldn't work, but, but I, I knew that the odds weren't in my favor, mm. but it was more like, oh, this is a compulsion yeah. um, to do this. And I, you know, a lot of people yeah, told me not to, but <laughs> uh, they might turn out though. to be right. Yeah. No, no, it's not <laughs> the case. And what was, once you kind of had that idea, 
what was tell us about that first year what happened yeah so okay so we spent a whole year basically preparing to launch the uk and european arm of this existing chinese electric motorcycle company and you know we spent ages doing market research we walked streets of london doing surveys we you know we get people to walk up and down flights of stairs with with like batteries to see what the battery weight needs to be. I mean, we do so, we spend so much time doing that. And start understanding how an import export business would work. So we miss out a pretty crucial bit of due diligence, um, which is the product itself. And so <laughs> when we get to China, uh, we also, so just before we leave, so we spend a year and just before we leave, we go, okay, like products, you know, ready. We need to drum up some interest here to, um, you know, get some people to commit to buying one. Not actually, we're not gonna take money off them yet. Um, so that we can go and negotiate a good deal with these Chinese partners. And so we get up 20 people, you know, we send them a, send them brochures, we handwrite them letters to say, you know, please will you be one of the early adopters? And anyway, so we get to China and it is a total disaster. It is just an absolute nightmare. So for those of you who don't know, China, in, sorry, Shanghai in January <clears throat> is freezing, but also incredibly damp. So it's okay. this weirdly oppressive, like this fog everywhere, like pollution cold. everywhere. It's, it is a cold. It's a, it's a cold. It's a cold experience. Um, and you know, we are. So the first thing we discover is that the product is just nowhere near the level of development that we've been led to believe. It is essentially a uh, put together prototype that they're just kind of making many prototypes and selling them as kits to people that you know may or may not kill those people because they're not properly constructed motorcycles and it wasn't really seb's mate's fault sorry yeah it wasn't seb's mate's fault because he was the more kind of like business side of the hmm. the person whose fault it was was his business partner yeah who we had we'd never met before i mean you know any entrepreneur will tell you you need to know who you're going to business with but we kind of took it as uh, given as given that he'd be decent um and he was he had this terrible messiah complex terrible working habits was utterly incompetent and had was supposedly an engineer, but really was a glorified mechanic. And it's almost lucky that he was so visibly terrible because, you know, we could have got there and we could have seen the products and we could have been like, do you know what? We're so deep in now. We've spent all of our money um, and we've drummed up the support. Like we'll make it work somehow. We'll improve the product together kind of thing. Luckily, he was so visibly not the right person to go into business with that we were able to pull the plug, but that, that period, that month we spent there, and bearing in mind, you know, we, we'd gone out there to bring back our first bikes. You know, we were going to be bringing them this, back yeah, in the our luggage. Yeah, the business was ready. The business, well, supposedly, yeah, the business was ready. In our <laughs> minds, the business was ready. It, and that was in our own heads. We were like, you should see that we got some like videos of kind of taking some the first only the first and only bit of content I've ever produced of like, we're on the plane, going to go start the business kind of thing. And we arrive and then it's just this total disaster. We're living throughout this period. We're living with Seb's best mate and his wife. And while this whole thing is becoming, it's becoming apparent to us that it's going to be a total disaster. And anyway, it ends with this hellish week where we're wrapping these bike components to send to their customers, these crappy bike components to send their customers in bubble wrap in, you know, in parts for these customers to be assembling these bikes themselves. We're not sleeping. We're trying to get it out all before Chinese New Year. And then finally on the last night, which we it's finally Will and Seb get their bikes and we build our bikes to take a photo of them. All This is all over the course of a night. Disassemble them, pack them into our hold luggage right. and then wheel <laughs> these two motorcycles in parts through Chinese security. And we're so exhausted and broke at this point that we are, you know, the only thing we want to do is get out of China. The only thing we want to do is for this hellish nightmare to be over. But because we are, you know, literally um, bankrupt at this point, we we are tr we're trying to avoid paying like excess baggage fees, which yeah. are obviously going to be a part of trying getting, to get, getting, getting a motorcycle onto a plane. <laughs> and, you know, there's these huge kind of like llama shaped kind of objects. And so we think we've kind of got through it. We think we checked it in and they gave me a thing. They're like, oh, you have to go pay over there. I didn't go pay over there. And so we're just getting onto the plane. And we're like, this nightmare's over. We had slept about an hour in the last three days. This nightmare's over. We're nearly on the plane. We're nearly on the plane. And I see this, I see this security official running towards me going, you've not paid, you've got paid. And I'm like, oh my God, I now have to go out of security just as I'm supposed to be getting on the plane, pay all the way back to security. I'm going to miss the flight. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be on my own. The whole thing's a disaster. And, uh, and you know, luckily did get on the plane, did make it. And it took us about, you know, we got back to the UK and we, you know, it was just, we needed about 
a week and a half of just like sleeping. Staring at, at, at And so I think a lot of, well, not a lot of people, but a lot, in a lot of situations, one would have pulled the plug at that mm. point and gone, okay, that was a nightmare. We're done. You know, you've embarrassed yourself. Like, luckily we didn't take any money off anyone. We had to write back to all these, you know, these early adoptions and say, sorry, not going to sell you that bike because it might've killed you. Um, and so, you <laughs> we know, don't have the insurance for that. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we don't have the insurance for that. And so I, so, but what we, but so it, it would have been sensible in many ways to pull the plug, but what we saw in China is without question what we think is the future of yeah. urban mobility. So which it's, is, it's there, but it's not here yet. It's there, but it's not here yet. And what's there is perfect for there but isn't right for here. Mm. Because after we pulled the plug on it, we went, okay, but are there any other ones out there yeah. we can import instead that aren't that aren't death traps? And we it, actually know, I mean, there are ones that aren't death traps, but they're not really built with the European market in mind. They're built mm. to very low quality standards. They're covered in injection molded plastic. And if somebody in the, in, in you know, somebody is making a purchase, an electric vehicle purchase over here, they're probably doing it at least in part for sustainability reasons. Mm. And so they don't want something to last 18 months, you know, they want it to be built to last a long time. And so that was kind of, we realized, okay, actually what we wanted to import here doesn't exist. Mm. So we'll build it ourselves and we'll we'll do that here. And how financially and mentally did you get back up after that point? Um, It was difficult. It was definitely difficult. And I think, you know, Seb and I did have a, we, we definitely, we spent about a month kind of, a month going, okay, that was hard with it. This would work. We think this would work, but, um, but do we have this in us again? And it's like, this is funny thinking about it. Cause that was just year one. And like, there were so many more horrible things yeah. that would happen. And, and we decided we would, and we, so we'd spent the next kind of three months purely focused on, on earning some money. We did actually a lot of that, uh, ridiculous film production stuff. Um, we, uh, yeah, we, we really dedicated ourselves to, to kind of just regenerating. Earning, yeah, to ge- regenerating. And we didn't, we didn't make, we didn't make enough money, but we got enough money to kind of get out of debt and, um, have, you know, a few thousand pounds to put towards the development of this prototype. Um, so, so that was, so that, yeah, so mentally it was kind of, fortunately is what we'd seen was gave us the confidence that, uh, that we were on the right track. And financially, if as kind of as I was saying earlier, if you put your mind to making money in you know a kind of temporary way, and by this point we've been doing this for a, a year plus, we knew kind of what the levers to pull on to really, really work. And to just say, I mean, I ate the Sainsbury's lentil dal soup every single one pound sixty every single lunch for eighteen months. You know, I, my my outgoings were minimal, yeah. were absolutely minimal. So yeah, you can you can kind of pull it together surprisingly quickly. And was there ever a point within that, that, you know, having come from quite a high flying, essentially a career before, like before that point that you had been on a certain track that you could have stayed on for 30 years and had great rewards from, was there any point during that getting back up period that you just thought, what the fuck have I done? And should I maybe swallow my pride and actually get back into it? No, there wasn't. There wasn't. And I think, look, I think if I, if this failed now, I don't think I'd have the, I don't think I'd have the the stones for another maving. I, I think I, I, I struggle to see myself going, I definitely wouldn't go back into m not a chance. I probably wouldn't go into finance uh, of any sort. Um, but I definitely wouldn't try and start another business that's trying to have an impact like this. Um, I use the word trying very consciously um because yeah so 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 did i think about it then no but i was i was one year in you know i'm four years in now and i've i'm older and you know to be honest at that time any the the, the kind of opportunity cost wasn't really there the only alternative to what i was doing was either going back into finance no thanks that was horrible or going you know living on a beach in indonesia and just surfing my whole time in two years from now say if maybe went bust you know, I might have a family, like you've got other commitments, you have to stop being quite so selfish because Mm. entrepreneurism is an incredibly selfish endeavor in many, many situations. So, so no at the time, maybe yes in the future. It makes complete sense. And how do you think you developed that kind of resilience? Do you think it, well, do you think it is resilient? Well, it's definitely resilience. I'm not going to ask you whether it is because whether you think it is or not, um, it, it, you know, resilience has played a huge part in that. Do you think it was something that you kind of, had developed over time or do you think it was this almost compulsion 
just to get the business going that it wasn't mm. even an option for you in your mind to to not do that yeah it was it was the latter i i would definitely i you know one of the reasons it can kind of work to tell the, the full story of, of my career was that i was you know people who think of me as a resilient person now or a hard worker now like i really wasn't you know growing up and I, it took me a very long time to become that person um but the entrepreneurial side of things is you know to to, to go through those challenges challenge after challenge that existential challenges you need to be absolutely convinced that you never could have done anything else that you are that if you don't do that thing you will regret it for the rest of your life that needs to be yeah a fundamental part of it for me for me and actually i need to preface basically everything i say today with going this is very much my experience there are many many very successful entrepreneurs much more successful than I am, who have a very different understanding of this stuff. But we hear those stories all the time. You, you do. And so, yeah, but so my, my take, but I really don't view myself, uh, I view myself as so far away as being a qualified expert on this. So I, it's my personal opinion and experience. And before we move on to that kind of exact experience of entrepreneurship and how you believe that that's not necessarily for everyone, can you just give us a quick whistle-stop tour of from them to now, the oh. kind of moving journey and where you are yeah, at the moment? Yeah, sure. Sure. So, okay, so decide to decide we are still going to go ahead with it. Know the bike needs to be made in Britain. Quality needs to be a focus. We know what the styling needs to have. You know, it needs to be affordable. Um, and we know that, uh, yeah, we know it's before. Oh, removable battery. Um, and so we then spent basically a year designing that bike, developing the first prototype, um, and that actually happened surprisingly quickly. And then we finished that first prototype in kind of January, February, 2020. Um, obviously, a, launching an automotive company, very, very capital intensive business. You need, you need a lot of money to get even to selling a single product. So we needed to raise some money. And we launched, we launched our fundraise in, in February, 2020. Uh, we, you know, starts going really well. We think we're hot stuff. Um, and we, you know, we get quite a significant commitments. Um, and we kind of, we've got this whole song and dance where, you know, Seb and I are in the room and we pull a, pull a cover off the bike and grand reveal. And between, uh, so then it gets to mid March, 2020, um, which was obviously when the world, but particularly the UK woke up to the realities of COVID-19. And I can remember it so well that, um, we pitched on Thursday, the 12th went really, really well. When, uh, sorry, Friday, I got my first call from an investor saying, obviously not going to be investing right now. The, you know, the world is losing its mind. Like everything's going completely crazy. I'm out kind of thing. And also you should probably put the raise on hold. I'm kind of going, oh, we're not going to put the raise on hold. It's yeah, going so great. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, are you kidding me? You know, the bike's still cool. Um, and by the end of that weekend, so that was the Friday, by the end of that weekend, every single investor had pulled out. We had a million quick off the table. And uh, by that Tuesday, so I'm still, you know, still kind of thinking I'm, raising with a business in, in, my, in my mind and by that tuesday i'm back on a plane to south africa once again totally bankrupt no business no possibility of business everything's stopped and the world's ending so it was and it was almost exactly a year after the whole china debacle so we had our second kind of major major crisis and i won't go into the uh boring details of the next kind of six months because they're depressing and it was it was it was very depressing it was definitely the hardest time I had was, was trying to raise money. And if, you know, as anyone listening, who's raising money. It's you're not alone. It's hard for everyone, no matter what you get told, it sucks. Mm. It's um, the hardest thing in the world. It's, it's the hardest thing in the world. It really is. You are putting yourself, you are exposing yourself to people who are almost incentivized to break down that thing, to try to drive, drive evaluation down on a constant basis, like a job interview three times a day, every day. So, you know, at the end of, at the end of it all, we do successfully get a deal done. And, you know, unsurprisingly, that is the point at which everything changes for the business. Um, because, you know, as is fairly obvious from mine and Seb's background, there's a, a gaping hole in the engineering area in the, you know, finance, Seb marketing. Um, so that needs to be filled really quickly if you're gonna launch an automotive product. And we are able to hire a guy called Graham Gilbert, who was head of product at Triumph Motorcycles, which Amazing. is the, for us, by far the kind of best motorcycle company in the world. Um, certainly the best British one. Um, you know, and Graham is arguably responsible for all of the most iconic modern British motorcycles. So there's really no one better to head up our, our engineering team. And how did you manage to hire him? So he joined Triumph when it was 
you know, Triumph has gone through many versions of itself mm. over the 100 plus years it's been around. But, you know, in the latest version of Triumph, uh, Graham joined when there was about 50 people and it was, uh, you know, in some ways a startup. And, you know, now the design engineering team that he led, you know, 350 people. Mm. So it had completely changed as a business. And he didn't like that. He's kind of got a bit of an entrepreneurial yeah. streak to him. It also culturally, it had massively changed. You know, you needed to, you needed to like tap out a time code to go to the loo. There's right. like a 10 minute slot to go make coffee. Mm -hmm. Like really, really very like- Amazon vibes. Amazon vibes, <laughs> Amazon vibes. Uh, he didn't like that either. But actually most importantly, if you're a motorcycle engineer and you feel that the direction of travel is, uh, is electric, and the company you're working for isn't making steps in that direction enough. Completely. And, you know, somebody comes along and they go, you know, come and join this with us. You get to build a culture from the ground up. You get to build yeah. a team from the ground up. And, you know, every person who ever works for us will have an equity position in the business. It, it, it's, yeah. it's appealing. And I find there's a lot, we get that a lot too. We get people from companies that I cannot imagine how they could leave so, like the biggest sportswear companies mm. out there. And the people who are heading up huge departments in those jumping at the chance to join Tala. And it's exactly that. It's the fact that people realize they're in the fashion industry, which is, as with transport, a huge generator yeah. um, of carbon emissions and also, you know, waste and all of these things. And actually, once you get to a point in your career, lots of these people then have the luxury to be like, I want to be part of the next big thing that's not only able to build this culture, but also able to not feel like on the everyday I'm contributing to the problem, yeah, which is the exactly. great thing about having a startup that has a purpose because you're able to get really great people yeah, that you totally. kind of look at them and you're like, are you sure? Like, I mean, <laughs> this was the thing. So we interviewed this guy in a park in Leicestershire during lockdown. Like it was a heat wave and I'm on a picnic rug sort of lounging around <laughs> this going, is what it will so be like. tell me about how you build a motorcycle. You know, it was the most absurd scene yeah. imaginable. And he's kind of riding around the product going like, yeah, well, this will probably work kind of thing. And, uh, and we're like, this is, the, this is the head of product at the, you know, our dream motorcycle company. And it was, it was yeah. So as you say, you know, having those things does, do, does enable you to attract talent, um, proper talent. And so he gave us, not only did he bring this kind of incredible raft of experience, but he also gave us the credibility to hire what we view as the most talent dense motorcycle engineering team on the planet. No, it's, it's not that big for an engineering team. It's, you know, we're 16 people now, um, but they've all got, you know, 15, 25, some, one guy's got 40 years experience. Mm. So that, you know, and it's that it's them. They are the reason that we have been able to build the product to the standard that it now is in the time frame that we, it, that we have for the price that it, yeah. it now is. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's interesting that kind of by far the most important part of the business has very little to do with me and Seb. You know, mm. fine, we, we managed to get these people, but they are the ones who've delivered this product that we are really, really, really proud of. Yeah, so I mean, it's ex exactly the same as me. I mean, I think yeah. that it that's the way you have different types of business. You have business that comes from product people, mm. which are always fantastic as well. And then you have businesses that come from like the concept side and you hire the best product people yeah. because it's, it's it's exactly that. It's, I don't I don't know how to sew patterns yeah. or how to like work a, I mean, I know how to work a sewing machine, but you know. Like, but you have fantastic taste though, right? As in like, well, you. Well, but as in like, <laughs> I have you have a background <laughs> in, but you have a background in, well, I, I, I suppose the same could be said about us motorcycles and that you you probably knew what you as wanted consumer, from the brand. Yeah. you were able to have a huge input in product Product and what makes a good product, yeah. which I think the best businesses come from people who want different in an industry, I think it's terrible grammar, in, in an industry that they participate in and they can't find that gap. Yeah, sure. sure. And obviously that was kind of a huge part of what you did. Um, from that point, um, I know we were talking before this episode and um, I asked you for some notes on what you kind of wanted to talk about and your career and all of that. And I absolutely loved this point and I'm going to read it out for people who are listening. Um, so you said, I'd also like to talk about just how fucking hard it's been. We finished our first prototype and launched our first fundraise in February, 2020 as COVID hit. Since then we have battled crisis after crisis after crisis. There have been some triumphs. There have been some really fun bits, but a lot of it has been a nightmare. I suppose I would like to discuss how I really don't think entrepreneurship is for everyone, but if it is for you, as it was for me, you will totally ignore that advice and do it anyway, but don't glamorize it because except in a very small majority of pe people and businesses, it's not glamorous at all. So I think this is so powerful. 
and also so not what you hear the majority of media um, about entrepreneurship kind of talking about, which is where you almost exclusively see success mm. stories or oh. fa glamorized failure stories. Yep. So it's kind of failure at a hindsight 2020 point yeah, rather like a than exactly failure. like, yeah, a, yeah. oh, yeah, but my first business failed. Yeah. And now I only have seven billion pounds. Yeah, yeah. um, I, I kind of like to hear more about this from your side and who you do think entrepreneurship is for. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I suppose that on the glamour point, like this is without question the most glamorous thing I've ever done. You know, I, <laughs> I spend most of my time in a it's warehouse in commentary. It? It's the lights, it's the fact that it's not in the Midlands. You know, it's like it, my my day-to-day -day life is incredibly unglamorous. Uh, I, you know, I'm either sitting behind a spreadsheet or I'm like in a workshop, you know, choosing whether there's a brush finish on a part or a, or a silver finish on a part. Um, and so, and that is, and you know, there's no glamour to actually going through like interview after interview after interview to, you know, have to let people go. It's a really, it's really challenging and it's really upsetting. And fundraising is, as I said earlier, the most horrible soul exposing part. The, the few moments of glamour are, are as much relief as they are anything mm. else. You know, when you close a round, you're not going, oh, I'm amazing. You're going, thank God we're you not going to run sleep. out of money. You don't go to the, I, I literally said in our first funding round, um, I said, don't, like, you'll know, like, my, my housemates kept saying like, are we, are we closing yet? Are we closing yet? Yeah, Just sort yeah, of yeah. shut, shut the fuck up. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was like, you'll know when we're closing because we'll be going to a club. Yeah, and we will then, be, be time having party. a great time. And we close and I went to bed. Yeah. Like I honestly went to bed, I switched off my phone and I just slept. And I was like, I, I, I didn't go on social media for two weeks. Yeah. I just, I was like, I do not exist <laughs> anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's it, it's, you know, it's really not glamorous. So, so don't get into it because, you know, you've seen something and you're like, oh, cool, or seen online, I'm like, oh, cool. That's a version of like yeah. my life that looks interesting. Um, the point, the point that I that I, I made in that was like, you will do this if you're going to do this. You will do this because you have you, you. There's no way that you won't. Like there is just absolutely nothing stopping you. No amount of sensible advice, no horror stories um, will ever ever put you off. And 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 that's fine. And I'm you know I, if you if you're like that, then I would say go do it. But don't kid yourself. It'll probably fail. Our business, if you you know if you look statistically. Whatever version of success our business has achieved, which you know is not very far, it will still probably fail. You know, it's it's like the odds are not for us. I will probably still have to go and do something else, or you know, probably not start another business, but find another way to make a living. Um, so motorcycle, <laughs> please do buy motorcycles, buy motorcycles. <laughs> um, keep me in the job. Um, so so yeah, so I would say, um, what do you need to do if you are going to do it? What do you need? So you need to absolutely 100% know that it's there's nothing else you could have ever done and that you need to do it. Um, you need to fully, which is linked, you need to fully commit to it. So you need to, uh, you know, we talked at the beginning of this conversation about whether you could do it whilst in a job. At the point you decide you actually want to be an entrepreneur, you have to really, yeah. really go for it. Like you have to put everything on the line yeah. for it. And you also, the, I think the relieving part of that is there are parts of entrepreneurship or there are types of entrepreneurship that don't need that all in in terms of the way where it's like of course if you're going to start a company especially a big idea company like you you have to be all in and you have to have a point where you say okay we know the mvp works or we know that it's going to be like this so we're going to go into it whereas you also can decide like you have every right to decide i'm going to be an entrepreneur kind of, or have a side hustle or be a freelancer or anything like this. And you can still do that. You don't have to decide that you're going to be an entrepreneur full stop because as you say, it's not for everyone. I'm so glad you brought this up. I really am because I would have completely forgotten to. You're absolutely right. There are, there are I'm sure there are many, many different kinds of businesses, but in my mind, there, are, there is the clear delineation between two types. The kind that is focused on scale and impact mm -hmm. and the kind that is focused on actually being a good part of someone's life. Yeah. And I, I realized this in having a conversation with a, the, a, another entrepreneur, a friend of mine who has a film production business, the one that I did some work for. And actually he has basically designed a business around what he wants to do, what he enjoys doing. And every day he goes out and he loves his job. And, you know, I don't enjoy yeah. most of my days. You know, yeah. most of my days aren't that fun. Um, and it doesn't mean un underlying all of it is a sense of purpose, which I couldn't live without, mm -hmm. but it's very important to understand that any advice or any, any opinion rather that I have on this issue 
is from my own frame of reference for, for a business that is trying to do what our business wants to do. It's not true for if you you know if you wanted to go and there's a million businesses that you wanted to go and start that you that you listed yeah. a couple of um, that wouldn't require this like you know fanatical obsession with doing it. Which I think as well is you know for people who read up a lot on tech businesses and Silicon Valley and all of these things, there is this one kind of big shiny accepted view of entrepreneurship, which is this highly scalable, highly intense kind of change the world big idea type business and that's what's seen as you know if you think you have to start a business and you have to get vc funding and it has to go mm. to a certain size you're essentially forgetting half of the picture which is actually you can build a business that you love doing that is that can be profitable that doesn't scale and that is just as valid but because there's so much of this kind of glorification of like okay but we're now valued at and yeah, then, so we can really start You know, stuff, exactly. Yeah. It's it's kind of seen as well, it's homogenized in terms of being entrepreneurship, which makes us see one thing as a successful version of the other, whereas they're actually two completely distinct mm. things yeah. that appeal to two completely distinct people. And I think also completely different types of businesses. Like you don't yes. have to want to stay scale a business hugely to be able to be an entrepreneur. Yes, although you do still need a risk appetite. You oh, still uh, need to be able to you you still need to be able to basically be okay As, with like losing all your money at whatever stage in your life you're at and going back to where one and getting another job. The same with I guess any type of freelance work yeah. that is also a, an aspect yeah. of entrepreneurship because yeah. you are going to have months where you make no money and you're yeah. going to have months where you make half your previous yearly salary. Exactly, exactly. And so yeah, well I, I do think that one can take a slightly, yeah, you, one can take a very different approach to entrepreneurship as the style that is is talked about so much. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's still, I still wouldn't say it's for everyone. Mm. I still wouldn't say that someone should look at it and go like, oh, my life looks like it would be funner and easier if I started a business. Like it, there will still be immense challenges that you yeah. do with it. I, I, I don't, I haven't got experience of them. So I, I yeah. Know. <laughs> as in of the, of the kind of, of the other kind, kind of business. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think that there's, uh, you know, there's, the media very much and social media included in that of course it's going to glorify and glamorize those particularly glamorous exciting sides of it and that is because all of these things are visual platforms mm. and therefore you're going to respond better to seeing someone in a beautiful penthouse on the river than you are to seeing or or you're going to love their pre started in the garage story but only when you see it um when they're then in the penthouse if yeah. that makes sense yeah for sure for sure um what would you say, looking back at everything, is the biggest mistake you made? Oh, that is such an interesting question. And I'm afraid I've just got such a cliche answer <laughs> for it. Was that like, so, okay. The biggest mistake we made very obviously was not doing any due diligence on the product from China. Like that was so clearly the biggest mistake. Um, and in that like, yeah, any, I mean, and actually it was not only a mistake, it was, it was arguably negligent. Like we, we, anyone could tell you that you needed to get to grips with who you were going to business with and with the product you were going to business with. Now, there were some mitigating factors. This was a very close friend of Seb's. You know, we had seen many, many photos of the bike, but, but that was a, that was a huge mistake, but it didn't, um, I, I don't regret it yeah. at all because and this is where the cliche comes in. What we learned from that experience was was fundamental to the business that we now run. I mean, the, the reason that we've been obsessed with sourcing components in the UK and building the bike in the UK is because of what we experienced firsthand in China with prototyping. Mean, the reason that, the, that we didn't launch until November when we actually had finished the product was because of our experience with drumming up interest from you know, the, the, the early adopters bef yeah. you know, before we were ready to. And so the learnings from that experience were like, with the core yeah. elements of the business strategy of naming. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also it's probably worth prefacing it with the fact that it's not an issue of Chinese production either. It's the completely different markets. It's mm. just that if you're making something that's essentially meant to be a really good, high-end, very kind of British motorcycle quality thing, yeah. then at the point that you realize that those are the boxes you want to tick and it's not kind of a super entry level product. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a premium product. Yeah, that, mass uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, that is a, it's a, it is an important point to make that I sometimes forget 
to, to, to do publicly is that those Chinese bikes, well, not the one that we were about to import, but the, the general market are brilliant for the Chinese yeah. market. I mean, they've nailed it. It's just it. completely different there's, market. There's a reason that their the 80% market share is, is electric. It's like, it works perfectly for that market. Um, but that market's very different too. Which I also think is a really important part in terms of entrepreneurship and launching a business in terms of so many gaps in the market are found by saying, this works really well in X country, mm, let therefore let's bring it here. I mean, there's a huge amount of kind of, for example, hard seltzers, mm. which are huge in the US and have Mother. not cracked the UK market. Interesting. It's as in you see loads of these companies popping up and popping up yeah. and it there's also clearly still a barrier there because yeah. they haven't taken on. Yeah, and it's yeah. it's about, you know, there are so many big ideas and you can get the best ones by seeing how other markets are doing it. Mm. But you cannot just expect to be able to just like copy paste. Work. Yeah. So just to end, because this has been punctuated by the different kind of crises that have punctuated your journey through entrepreneurship and how, I mean, I always talk about entrepreneurship as a literal problem solving exercise all the time. It's like problem whack-a-mole. It's like one goes down, yeah. another one pops right back up. Tell us about a crisis that you're currently experiencing. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got a good one. So, so I guess we get to launch. I suppose this isn't currently this minute, but it's like it's it's it, the impact is still ongoing. Uh, we get to November last year, and we've got through the very very challenging uh, process of developing a motorcycle amidst COVID, amidst the supply crisis. You know, you know, factories all across the world have shut down. Blah blah blah. Parts delayed. Ships getting lost at sea, all that sort of stuff. And we finally got this product made and we love it and we think it's brilliant. And we, we're now about to go into this process. We didn't know how well it was going to sell, right? We, you know, we had, we had a, a sort of waiting list of people, you know, our mates who said they were going to buy one, but we needed to sell it really, really quickly to prove, you know, we need to sell our first batch really, really quickly to basically prove that there was significant demand for this that, so that we could then that was essentially raise more money that so that we could then buy the next batch of parts. So it was kind of really high stakes moment for the business. And I had felt, you know, the fundraising period had been, a lot of the weight had been on my shoulders. And, you know, Seb, it was now his time to to bear the, the weight of the business on his shoulders. And we kind of had that conversation. I was like, look, I'm I'm pretty burnt out right now. Like I need I need to not feel like this is this is for me. And he was like, yeah, totally agreed. Like I'm ready. I've got a plan. I'm excited. Like let's go. I'm I'm a salesman. And we're just about to push the button out and turn the website live. Exit stealth mode. Go go go. And Seb's voice had been really hoarse for like the previous couple of months. And and I was kind of been pestering about this, being like, dude, you probably got to go to the doctor. Like what's going on with your voice? Yeah. And he goes to the doctor and he finds out that he's got a, a cyst on his vocal cords, which is completely benign in every way, except for the fact that it means that he can't speak. <laughs> so he has to go and have this operation. He has to be completely signed up to, uh, for four weeks. Then he has to have, so it goes down. Then he has to have an operation. Then he has to be signed up for like another eight to 16 weeks afterwards. Which lends itself to the, the pitching very strongly. Well, exactly. So here's our chief salesman in chief about to go into the market, launch the product. And it's really, it's his moment. And, and he gets told that he can't use his voice. I mean, it's like something out of a Greek tragedy where, you know, thou must go out and sell a million pounds worth of motorcycle, but thou cannot use that voice. You know, it's like a specific kind of challenge. <laughs> and actually it was actually, it was almost a, a, a sort of watershed moment for me because I, I, it just, it was so funny, you know, it was so ridiculous that, that this, this had yeah. happened, that it was funny. And yeah, you know, he still can't speak. You know, he, he would probably be the, uh, the natural person for this show, um, if, if he could, but he can't use his voice for more than five minutes an hour at the moment. It would be a short podcast. It would be a short podcast. We could have a, a trailer. Yeah, it would be a lot of Grace talking. Yeah, that's fine. I can do that well. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's an ongoing crisis, but I suppose to, to end on a positive note when it comes to all these crises is that, um, is I, I hope I've given an accurate portrayal of the lack of glamour that is in business, but oh, is in starting a business. But the thing that is true and, and maybe is evidenced by the fact that I found it quite funny when that happened was that once you've gone through enough of mm -hmm. these truly existential crises, like and that was that one sounds funny, but it really meant okay, well maybe we're not going to be able to sell these bikes then. Yeah. Maybe we are going to go bust again. Nearly going to go bust again. And and but once you've gone through enough. The faith you develop is not that you know, not not that the crisis will resolve itself, but that you will work it out. Even yeah. the, even if you don't have the solution right now, you will work it out because you worked it out the last time, and you worked it out the time before that, and you worked it out the time before that. And 
you know, maybe this is going to end with me having now got complacent when it comes to crises and because I'm still able to sleep while they're ongoing, I don't solve them, but I don't think so. I yeah. think actually you've just developed a bit of a skin for it and it makes you more able to, to kind of manage them. Well, I think that's a fantastic place to end. Thank you so much for coming on. You have been incredibly honest, incredibly insightful, and I know there'll be a lot of people who really needed to hear this. Um, I want to end by also, if people have listened to this and they all now on their minds now want to be getting a Maving motorcycle, is there a wait list they have to join? Is there a place they have to go to? Tell us so, how to get them. So there is a wait, well, there is a wait list. By the time this airs, we will have gone on sale. So there's currently a wait list of like 2,350 people. Wow. Um, but if you, by the time this airs, we will be on sale. Um, those bikes will be being delivered in August, that, that sort of the next production run. Um, and so if you go to maving.com, you can configure your bike there. You can have a play around with it. You can try different colors um, and you can, you can click the buy button. That's very exciting. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Grace. This has been a lot of fun.